Welcome to the Dr. Journal Club podcast, the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Continue your learning after the show at www.drjournalclub.com. Please bear in mind that this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Talk to your doctor before making any medical decisions, changes, etc. Everything we're talking about, that's to teach you guys stuff and have fun. We are not your doctors. Also, we would love to answer your specific questions. On drjournalclub.com, you can post questions and comments for specific videos. But go ahead and email us directly at josh at drjournalclub.com. That's josh at drjournalclub.com. Send us your listener questions and we will discuss it on our pod. I love French press. And welcome to the Dr. Journal Club, where <laughs> the questions are made up and the research doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you caught us in the middle of a deep conversation about different ways to make coffee. But um, <laughs> I like that intro. But seriously, why, why don't you just make a French press? Why are you... No, nah, it's a good idea. Meal prepping your Keurigs like a freak. First of all, it's not a Keurig. <laughs> As I explained to you, it's an espresso, which is a whole nother, nother level of like hoity-toity. Um, I don't know. I hadn't actually thought about that. Oh, I know why. Because it's going to be cold. So, well, oh, so like you'd say, like have a have like a, a hot water maker, make a pot of French press and then just, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. I should probably just do that. That would have been a lot cheaper. Yeah, like the French press I have is, is like metal. So like the glass ones suck. Yeah, but they're classic. But the metal, there's like, there's like a metal one. The metal ones are nice. Yeah, the metal ones like keep it insulated. I, I miss French press. I haven't done... I go through phases. Like I did mochas for a while. You know those things they do at England. Um, mochas. I haven't done. Yeah, they're like these little. There's water on the bottom. You put it on the stove top, and it like percolates. Oh, the mocha pot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So my mocha pot broke though. I was pissed. I know. I like. I love. I love those things, but they they, they don't always last forever. Anyway, what are we talking about today? What's our uh, you know what you should get? You should get like little sand con- like convection oven so you can make your own Turkish coffee. Oh, so speaking of Turkish coffee, okay, last last thing. I, I could talk about coffee all day long. Um my my neighbors are um are Muslim and they they basically like live on Turkish coffee. Like they're from the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And it's like um we went over there a couple months ago and they served us Turkish coffee. And I haven't had Turkish coffee since I lived in Israel, like when I was like younger and I forgot how much I love it. Mm-hmm. They call it boats over there, which means like mud because that's like literally what you're yeah. drinking <laughs> like at the bottom anyway. And I just love the, I love the, um, I don't know. I love the culture of it. I love the history of it. I love the ritual of having these little things. And so I ended up buying some, so I, I got them to help me find proper like Turkish coffee because I think it's like cinnamon that's mixed with it or something like that. There's a spice. Uh, not cinnamon. It is cardamom. 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 Okay. Um. And uh. So I so they they approved and then I bought like the whole apparatus and I I did it for a little while. I really I really liked it. It is a bit of a pain to prepare it, but um. But yeah, it's, it's cool because you have to like wait for it to spoil just so and then you have to take off the top and. Anyway, now we're really wasting time. Okay, don't go, listener. We're we're going to talk about research here in a second. So this is my third attempt to bring us back to research. Let the records show. Um, all right. So what are we talking about? There? Oh, ashwagandha. We're talking about ashwagandha. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What do you got for me? This is your paper. Is it my paper? Yeah, you recommended it. You've been like every time I've been like, let's do this, let's do this. You're like, well, what about the ashwagandha paper, Josh? And uh, now we're doing your ashwagandha paper. Well, that's because you want to keep doing. You want to keep doing these like weird methods that that don't, don't matter. Everyone that listens to this podcast is a methods fan. I just want to say that, and we should have like a, a poll. People should call in and be like, "Yeah, no, I'm a methods guy. I don't know what this okay. what you guys talking about." <laughs> <laughs> All right, ashwagandha. Back. Focus. I need to drink my coffee. All right, you start us off. Can you spell ashwagandha without having to Google it? No. And why should I? This is an AI world. This is fair. We don't need to spell anymore. This is fair. Um, I can't spell it either. But 
anyway, so this was a cool paper. Um, at least I thought it was going to be cool. It was not. Um, it was a systematic review. Walk us through the context. Yeah. Yeah, it was a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials looking at ashwagandha supplementation for the management of anxiety and stress. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who don't know, uh, ashwagandha is uh, it's an herb. Um, and it's considered to be part of a class of herbs called adaptogens. Um, and adaptogens are kind of these, they're pretty cool and sort of like their non-scientific mechanism of action in that um, basically if you're feeling low, they'll help sort of like elevate you. And if you're feeling a bit stimulated, they'll help kind of calm you down. So they adapt to to your environment uh, in, in that sense. And so um, there is actually quite a bit of evidence for... Um, ashwagandha in that class of, of herbs. So another one would be like rhodiola uh, for a number of things, but uh, particularly what we're looking at today is, is the management of, uh, I, I kind of focus on the anxiety. I didn't really care so much about the stress, but I guess we could talk about both today if we want. Yeah. Well, um, but that's what these authors did was they kind of looked at randomized controlled trials and, and tried to summarize the evidence for them. Yeah. And I think to your point, like the reason they looked at stress is traditionally it's used as this adaptogen. And so like you would like clinically, like I would recommend adaptogens for people that come in and they're just like stressed out. Like they may not like meet anxiety criteria, but you know, they're just kind of overwhelmed with life and they need something to level them out. That's how I think about it. And yeah, I was taught the same way. I was always kind of curious, like clinically, like I've always found them very helpful personally and with patients. And then but yeah, like the, the herbal explanation, I was always like, I wonder if that's a real thing, like this sort of like leveling you out thing. And what does that look like biochemically? And um, I, I don't know. But um, anyway, so uh, yeah, I was I was kind of excited about it. Why don't we go through the method? Yeah, there's not a huge. <laughs> What's that? The methods. Let's dive into the methods. Yeah, there's not a huge amount to go over in the methods. Um, well, we should do like pros and cons of methods. Um, in a little bit, but maybe first, what I'm thinking we do is first just like talk about the results of what they found, and then we can sort of critique and go back to methods and see what we what our take homes are. Yeah, um, sort of sort of like long story short, they found that um, ashwagandha, uh, when pooled together, was beneficial for both stress and anxiety. Um, and they did find that there was a dose response relationship where uh, the more ashwagandha that uh, was was taken, uh, the the greater the improvement. However, <laughs> um, the majority of the dosing was around like 300 to 600 milligrams. And then there was one trial that looked at 12,000 milligrams. Um, and so when you actually look at figure four, it's just a straight line down. <laughs> right. Um where they're, they're, the dose response is, is essentially linear um, in that the more ashwagandha, the, the, the greater the reduction in anxiety. Um, I don't know if they report about the safety of that. Right. That seemed like a crazy amount. Um, however, it's not a dose that I am, I am familiar with. No, no, me neither. And yeah, to your point, I think that entire dose response relationship was driven by that single data point. And I don't know that I necessarily would would trust it. But interestingly, like you've got a bunch of these studies that use similar dose. So yeah, so they found just just um, so people have a sense of the evidence base to support this, like, again, these were just these were randomized control trials only. Um, and they found eight randomized control trials on anxiety, um, with about five, 550, 550 patients total, um, and a standardized mean difference of 1.55. So like we talked about, that's usually usually considered like a large effect. Um, statistically significant. And for stress, seven randomized control trials, also a large effect, uh, standardized mean difference of 1.75, also statistically significant. So uh, quite a, a relatively large number of studies that were identified. And again, these are randomized trials. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, the grade level, so they did do a grade assessment, which is how we measure the confidence we can have in their estimate. So they're estimating this large effect on stress and anxiety. How confident can we be in that? They rate it as low, a uh, low certainty of evidence, and they rank down for inconsistency. That's because their um, heterogeneity marker was, um, it was high. Yeah. It was like, like super high. And they, 
92% or something like that for anxiety and 83% for stress. Yeah. And that's, that's the I square. And so just for the listener, you want like a 0%, like that would be awesome if you had 0%, but certainly under 50%. But that also makes sense when you look at like the different types of trials that they looked at, they, they kind of used all, it wasn't only anxiety and stress. They, they looked at a kind of a diverse population. That's right. Not just healthy people, all sorts of different clinical conditions. You know, actually, so speaking of, they they did some really neat things. Like they did a heterogeneity explanation. Like they looked at uh, or exploration. They looked at um, different ways of dividing up the studies to see if it explained the heterogeneity, which is what you're supposed to do. And um, they were actually able to explain like a decent amount of the heterogeneity. Yeah. Um, I think to your point, like they got when they just bulked it by what was it, healthy people versus diseased populations, they had like really clean, like, okay, these are the apples, these are the oranges type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I felt like they probably could have, they don't necessarily, didn't necessarily need to rank down for heterogeneity because a lot of that heterogeneity they could explain. And it also kind of made sense if you think about it too, like higher doses in older people of trials that were of larger sample size, and in people who had psychological disorders were, seemed to be greater responders than younger, healthier people of smaller trial size with lower dosing. Like it just, kind of just makes sense. Yeah, it did. I thought, I thought it was, it was pretty intuitive. Look, the thing is we don't do this for money. This is pro bono. And quite honestly, the mothership kind of ekes it out every month or so. Right. So we do this because we care about this. We think it's important. We think that integrating evidence-based medicine and integrative medicine is essential, and there just aren't other resources out there. The moment we find something that does it better, we'll probably drop it. We're busy folks. But right now, this is what's out there. Unfortunately, that's it. And so we're going to keep on fighting that good fight. And if you believe in that, if you believe in intellectual honesty in the profession and in integrative medicine and being an integrative provider and bringing that into the integrative space... Please help us. And you can help us by becoming a member on Dr. Journal Club. If you're in need of continuing education credits, take our NANSIAC approved courses. We have ethics courses, pharmacy courses, general courses. Just interact with us on social media. Listen to the podcast. Rate our podcast. Tell your friends. These are all ways that you can sort of help support the cause. So, um, so basically what you have is a systematic review of randomized controlled trials for ashwagandha low level evidence on uh, large effect sizes uh, for that. And um, before we, so on its face, I thought it was a pretty good study. Um, and then I like that they did grade. I like that, it, you know, you know, they did heterogeneity exploration. So they were like speaking to my heart. And then someone mm -hmm. asked me in our evidence synthesis lab about how you evaluate systematic reviews. So I like started talking about AMSTAR 2, which is this checklist for quality and systematic reviews. It's like, oh, let me just apply the AMSTAR 2 since I'm prepping for this pod. And it was like terrible. <laughs> like, oh, well, really? Yeah. It had like, um, uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll give a quick, are you familiar with, how are you familiar with AMSTAR 2? Well, we talked about it at, with the last podcast episode with the blood pressure. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So they had done their own assessments of, of the quality of the systematic review. So there's the, the quote unquote quality of the evidence within a systematic review, but then there's the quality of how the systematic review itself was conducted. That's what AMSTAR 2 is. And AMSTAR is basically all these brilliant Cochrane methodologists who got together and were like, okay, what are the most important domains to think about for systematic reviews? There's, I think there's like 13 of them. And seven of which they say are critical. So, you know, you could have a few non-critical domains and get a, a red mark and that's fine. You could still trust the results. But if you have even one in these critical domains, basically they view it as a critically flawed study and you need to be extraordinarily uh, cautious. And of the seven critical domains, I they got a red mark, at least when I did it, on one, two three, four, three, three and a half. <laughs> so uh, critically flawed, turns out. Um, and just for the for the listeners, like what these 
um, essential things are that you should be looking for when you're evaluating a systematic review. Um, the probably the most important, which you pointed out in in the green room, was having a a priori registered protocol. Um, and so they claim they had a protocol, but it was not registered. I don't think at all, let alone before they started looking at results. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I feel like that also doesn't really change sort of the takeaway from this study, uh, because they're kind of already saying that the certainty of the evidence is, is low to begin with. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's bad. It's just that, you know, can we really trust these results? Not really. We need, we need more evidence, um, that, that may kind of sway things to, towards the null or, or, or be consistent with these findings. Um, overall, you know, we only have a, a handful of trials that are kind of small. We have only 300 in the intervention group and 250 in the comparison or so in the placebo group for anxiety specifically. The risk of bias was low. However, you know, we, we saw pretty consistently the, in, the, the imprecision uh, in the results. Um, and, you know, it's really just a heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, population. There was really only two trials that actually looked at, um, you know, individuals with, with an anxiety disorder. One trial looked at 500 milligrams per day. Another one looked at 12,000 milligrams per day. Um, all the other trials looked at people with insomnia, healthy adults, uh, schizophrenia or schizoaffective, uh, bipolar. And really what they did was because of the standardized mean difference, they just kind of looked at um, the, the questionnaires that they used and kind of pooled the results from that. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, even without use, looking at the AMSTAR, you, you still have to kind of take this with, with a grain of salt. And I don't, I don't think that the AMSTAR really changes much for this, in, this one in particular. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like, um, I was kind of thinking about that a bit when we were going over last, the last one we did on blood pressure, you know, because you're looking at both the grade results, which is the confidence in the evidence, and then the results of the quality of the study that's sort of coming up with that quality of evidence. And so, yeah, so where do you, like, where do you weigh? And, and I, to your point, okay, let me like think through what you're saying. If you're like, well, the evidence level is already low, we're already going to have a lot of skepticism about this. And so, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. So in this case, let me think this through for a bit. Yeah, they didn't register their protocol. What's the major fear with that? That they change their outcome measures or something like this and they're cherry picking. But to your point, they're doing standardized. Do you also, difference. Yeah. Do you also give them a little bit of credit for like directly saying we did not register this? No, no. because I bet that was a peer review comment that was like, you need to say if this is registered or not. Cause that's part of like, um, that's, that's part of like the standard reporting. You have to say what your registration is or if it was not registered. And I don't know, that was my read between the lines is they were forced to do that for publication. Cause that's the, to meet criteria, you know, that's kind of how it goes. Um, like Prisma SR or whatever is, I think that's part of the standard reporting. Right. But, um, so, okay, so so maybe, but but yeah, so it's not like they're cherry picking outcomes because they're they're st they're basically pooling all outcomes about stress and anxiety. Stress and anxiety makes sense for an adaptogen to be looking at. So that doesn't seem too suspicious to me. Um, yeah, so I don't know. And then I didn't love their search. I thought their search was a little bit weak, but they found like nine randomized controlled trials. That's a lot of evidence. Like, is it possible there's a bunch of other studies out there that they didn't find? I don't know. I kind of doubt it. Maybe, maybe. Um, so yeah, so I don't know. It's interesting to kind of think about, and that's a good point because we really should not be thinking about these quality tools as checklists, right? Like we need to be thinking through how they would impact our interpretation. And so, yes, yeah, so let me look at that. So, so the protocol, maybe we give them a pass. I mean, we don't give them a pass, but how that influences our thoughts about the evidence. Maybe it doesn't change it. Um, literature search, we said, maybe that doesn't change it. Um, what else did I flag them for? They didn't talk about funding of the, of the studies, or at least I didn't see that. That's sort of the new thing in Amstar 2 to really call that out. And we've talked about how that's pretty important. Um, 
Yeah. And I can see how funding would be an issue because, I mean, they, you know, they said that they had no conflicts of interest to declare. So perhaps that's. Yeah. No, not them. Not them. The of the primary studies. They didn't report on. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. So that's like two levels. So, like, do the authors of the systematic review have conflicts? So they claim no. But then did they report on of these nine studies which had financial funding issues that need to be aware of? But in theory, that should have been taken into account for the risk of bias assessment, right? I mean, maybe, maybe not. Um, so anyway, interesting. Um, but I think your your greater point is is super valid, which is the evidence is already low. We're already not sure about this effect size. It is a large effect, but it might shift tomorrow if someone actually publishes a large new randomized controlled trial with, with results that, that differ. So yeah, I think those are the main take-homes that I had for this study. So a little bit of a short uh, summary, pretty straightforward for me. Anything else you wanted to touch on on this one? Um, I, I think we, we commented about this earlier um, when we were talking about this paper. I thought it was kind of interesting that um, on their on their PICO, um, PICO stands for Population Intervention Comparison and Outcome. Um, their comparison was placebo or no intervention, uh, and that that really matters because uh, no intervention is is kind of uh, an intervention in a way. It's it's basically like our waitlist control, which is not the same as placebo. But on their exclusion criteria. Um, they excluded trials without any placebo group. So I'm just not sure if this was um, like a language barrier issue because this this was a, a publication that came out of Iran. Um, and so I don't know if this was sort of, uh, they just needed some help in, in translating to English manuscript um, or what, uh, but I kind of thought that was a little bit contradictory. It's like, are, are you, is your comparison pl placebo? Uh, is it either or? Was it this an issue because it was a, it was not registered? Um, so it was kind of kind of just interesting to see. Yeah, I agree. I I saw that too. I, and I my comment next to it was sloppy reporting or sloppy language, and it might have been a language barrier thing for sure. Because you're right, that did contradict itself. And when you look at the table of the studies, they all the controls are placebo. So I don't know if. That's because that was actually the the inclusion criteria, or um, it just happened to all be placebo controlled and not active controlled. It's it's hard to say, um, right? But while while we're looking at that, just to describe some of these studies a little bit further, yeah. So like dosing, like you said, between mostly between three hundred milligrams a day and six hundred milligrams a day. Six hundred seems to be one of the more common dosing regimen. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is interesting. And uh, yeah. And and one thing I would say too is just about Amstar for a second is I went, as I was going over it again to, to present on it, it's a really great learning tool. So, and it's designed for clinicians that don't necessarily have like methodological experience and it's designed to be done in like 15 minutes or less. So if you're a listener and you're primarily a clinician and you come across a systematic review that you're interested in and you wonder how much, you know, how well it is, how well conducted it is and how well done it is, grab the Amstar 2 checklist and the the questions guide you through what to look for. Um, and again, a little bit of practice, you're done in 15 minutes and you have a good learning tool and assessment for, you know, faith. That, we get that a lot, right? People want to know, is this a good study? And, you know, we can look at it, but I think it's even better if like you can learn these instruments that are really not that difficult to and they're designed not to be difficult to do yeah i would agree cool all right anything else no sir that's it okay so short one today um interesting straightforward systematic review some quibbles but for the most part probably doesn't change our our take home which is interesting large effect surprising number of studies but low level evidence uh overall all right, dear listener, thanks for checking in, and we will see you next time. If you enjoy this podcast, chances are that one of your colleagues and friends probably would as well. Please do us a favor and let them know about the podcast. And if you have a little bit of extra time, even just a few seconds, if you could rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or any other distributor, it would be greatly appreciated. It would mean a lot to us and help get the word out to other people that would really enjoy our content. Thank you.
Hey, y'all, this is Josh. You know, we talked about some really interesting stuff today. I think one of the things we're going to do that's relevant, there is a course we have on Dr. Journal Club called the EBM Boot Camp that's really meant for clinicians to sort of help them understand how to critically evaluate the literature, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that we've been talking about today. Go ahead and check out the show notes link. We're going to link to it directly. I think it might be of interest. Don't forget to follow us on social and interact with us on social media at Dr. Journal Club, DR Journal Club on Twitter. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So please reach out to us. We always love to talk to our fans and our listeners. If you have any specific questions you'd like to ask us about research, evidence, being a clinician, et cetera, don't hesitate to ask. And then of course, if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on the pod, please let us know as well. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Journal Club podcast the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Be sure to visit www.drjournalclub.com to learn more.